Have you ever wondered how man got to the moon? I'm Brett Bailey, and we're going to discuss that right now on Our Night Sky. One of my earliest memories as a child growing up on a horse farm was the night that my parents turned to my three brothers and I and told us that the Russians had just launched a satellite into orbit. This was back in October 1957, and I was just coming up to about four years of age. So that evening, when it got dark, Mom and Dad took my three brothers and myself out to one of the fields in our horse farm where we watched this very, very faint light go across the southern sky. We had seen Sputnik. Now at the tender age of four, I really didn't understand what this all meant, but it changed the world. One month later, Russia launched Sputnik 2, and on board that was a small stray dog from Moscow named Laika. The dog and the rocket went up into space zipped around the earth and landed it back down on terra firma in Russia. This now became in America the Sputnik crisis. The Americans had to do something. NASA needed a rocket quickly and soon a Redstone rocket which was an ICBM used by the Army became available. Modifications were needed to accommodate a crew and a capsule. We'll change directions here for a minute and we're going to talk about the basics of what a rocket is. A rocket is something that is used to propel a payload up into space. So there's the payload, the rocket portion, which is 95% tanks of rocket fuel and an oxidizing agent. There isn't enough ambient air to combust the volume of rocket fuel that's going to be expelled, so they need to have an oxidizer twinned with that. The rocket fuel and the oxidizer are combined in the rocket engines, and they're burned, and that creates thrust. Now the Redstone rocket would generate about 265,000 pounds of thrust. That would be enough to get them into a higher elevation, but they would need more power to eventually get themselves injected into an Earth orbit. And the rockets they would use would be the Atlas rockets. They'd be a two-stage rocket, meaning that there was a first stage. The first stage would, would burn until all of its fuel was expended, then it would separate, and the second stage would then push the capsule into an Earth orbit. Now the Atlas rocket used about 360,000 pounds of, of thrust to get into orbit, but eventually when they built the behemoth Saturn V for the Apollo missions, that rocket was absolutely huge. It was the, one of the largest things, certainly the largest vehicle man had made at that time. It was 363 feet tall, or 111 meters, making it 60 feet taller than the torch on the Statue of Liberty. It also had massive rockets and massive fuel capacities. It had three stages. First stage would generate 7.5 million pounds of thrust. And that was to get the second stage, the third stage, the lunar excursion module, the service module for the capsule, and the capsule itself that had three men in it. In the early days of Mercury, the rockets were fairly simple and basic. They had enough instrumentation in there that one of the Mercury's uh, task was to control the flight of the rocket by using thrusters and, and uh, mini rockets around the space capsule in order to control their yaw, pitch, and roll. Now yaw is when the capsule is flying and the nose goes off center line like that. It'll happen with their planes if they're flying in, in a very strong lateral wind. The pitch is when they have to control the elevation of the nose up or down for certain maneuvers. And then roll is the rolling motion of the capsule or an airplane. Part of the function of Mercury was to see if they, if they could control the capsule in a roll, in a pitch, and a yaw and maintain that. Some of those maneuvers were going to be required when the mission and the orbits were ended, they had to turn the space capsule over so that the retro rockets were facing the direction they were traveling in and they could fire and reduce the speed of the capsule to orbital decay and that would eventually allow it to fall into the Earth's atmosphere. Once the retro rockets had completed their job, they would be jettisoned and it would just be the whole heat shield be covering the bottom of the space capsule that would bring the astronaut back through the atmosphere at a fairly high rate of speed. Eventually the atmosphere would help slow it down, but it would build up a tremendous amount of friction. And without that heat shield, the capsule would simply burn up like a meteor. At a certain elevation, about 32,000 feet, the space capsule would deploy a drogue parachute. And that drogue parachute would inflate, slowing the space capsule down, but it would also deploy a large 25 meter parachute. That would be the final resting speed for the 
capsule before it landed in water. Now, to, in order to ensure the safety of the, the astronauts, on top of the space capsule before the rocket launched was a launch escape system. And that was a, a tower with four dry propellant rocket engines on it that was attached to the space capsule so that if something happened during the ignition sequence or during the launch or at any other time that a man was inside the capsule and he had to evacuate the rocket, he could fire this escape system by himself or it could happen automatically as well. And I'm sure Cape Canaveral Control Office could manage that. But that would detach the space capsule from the rocket. It would leave the launch pad, take the space capsule with it in a direction to ensure its safety. When it had finished its job, the launch escape system would jettison away and the capsule would be able to release the drogue chute, which would release the main parachute, and it would fall gently into the ocean. The system failed the first time they used it. Mercury 1 was to launch off pad at Cape Canaveral, unmanned, and again this was to ensure that all the systems would function properly before they relied on them to put a person on board one of those crafts. The rocket's engines fired themselves as planned, but they cut out very, very quickly. And the rocket only launched about four inches. It became known as the four-inch launch. It settled back down on Earth, suffered some minor damage, but it was able to be repaired and reused. But while the engineers were trying to figure out what they were going to do, the launch escape system fired off, and it went about 4,000 feet, but it didn't take the capsule with it. The launch escape tower expended its fuel, fell to Earth, and then just shortly after that, the drogue chute on the capsule, still attached to the rocket, it went blink, and it took off. But it stayed attached to the rocket, and it draped down the side of it. Now, if the wind had picked up and inflated that parachute, it would have knocked the rocket over, and that would have been a catastrophe. Fortunately, that didn't happen, and they were eventually able to recover everything and, and save that mission. Now, NASA's second flight, the second launching of, of a Mercury Redstone rocket, was a much better success. It was still unmanned, but it did carry a chimpanzee with it named HAM. HAM is an acronym for the Holloman Aerospace Medical Center. The rocket uh, flew to another elevation slightly higher than what they had intended and that took it off course for meeting its, its target splashdown. It landed about 60 miles or 100 kilometers away from the nearest recovery ship. By the time they got to him, the heat shield had been damaged and punctured, punctured the uh, bottom part of the spacecraft and was allowing water in. And uh, poor Ham was in there. By the time about 800 pounds of water had got inside the inner part of the uh, capsule. Anyway, he was picked up and recovered. They opened up and he was sitting there happily inside gave the people a big smile when he was handed an apple and a half an orange to eat. So it was basically a successful mission. The next flight was Mercury 3. Alan Shepard was the pilot on that one. And then Gus Grissom piloted Mercury 4 afterwards. These were the first two manned flights by the Americans in space. They were suborbital flights in that the rocket went up to a targeted altitude, jettisoned the uh, launch vehicle and the capsule then returned back over the ocean into uh, into the water and was picked up with John Glenn was the first one to orbit the earth and he completed four orbits did some other tests and experiments they began to get a sense of what they had to learn to do before the Gemini programs came about thank you for watching be safe be smart and take a break and get out to enjoy our night sky I'm Brett Bailey and thank you